Perhaps one of the most perplexing aspects of our solar system is the fact that not every planet is a lovely solid sphere like our Earth. Some are almost entirely made of gas. If you visited Jupiter, you wouldn't be able to stand on its surface. You'd likely fall through its gaseous layers, all the way down to the planet's core. You'd have to survive an incredible amount of pressure before hitting its potentially rocky core. Whatever the case, mysterious gas orbs have always intrigued scientists. Luckily, now they have the James Webb Space Telescope to satisfy their curiosity. The incredibly powerful infrared eyes of this instrument see much more than what the telescopes of the past could spot. And recently, a team of researchers announced they may have noticed something interesting about the dynamics of gas giant formation. All thanks to James Webb. Soon, we might be able to answer how long gas giants have to form around their parent stars before all the gas around those stars fades away. At the moment, it seems like this period of time isn't too long. But there are some nuances. The team used the Webb telescope to probe the disk wind. This name doesn't really refer to any kind of wind. Instead, it refers to the process of gas leaving a disk around a star. The so-called disk, also known as a protoplanetary disk, is filled with various stuff and has the potential to give birth to planets. Astronomers knew such disks existed and could play an important role in disk evolution. But they couldn't figure out the underlying physics or estimate how much mass was lost in the process. Now, they might be able to do so. The wind disk studied by the team seems to move at a rate of 6 to 9 miles per second, which is quite slow for something moving in the vastness of space. Fast-moving gas patterns, known as jets, can boast speeds of more than 62 miles per second. The researchers haven't come to any specific conclusion about how long gas planets have to form before depleting protoplanetary disk gas completely. But based on their preliminary calculations, it might take about 1,100 years. Even though it sounds like a really long time for us Earthlings, in astronomical terms, it's an incredibly short timescale. For comparison, a protoplanetary disk can live for 5 to 10 million years. One of the main difficulties in examining disk wind movements is finding a protoplanetary disk. But our solar system doesn't have any. All our planets are formed and complete, including gassy ones. That's why the team found another target a disk around a young, low mass star called T Chi. This star, lying 350 light years away from Earth, is quite interesting in its own right. It has a large dust gap in its disk. It's thought to be created by a planet or planets, consuming all the material on its way around the star. Such a gap may suggest that the star has budding planets orbiting it. It's also old enough for those nascent worlds to munch on parts of the disk itself. It might be what we know as the transition stage, moving from a protoplanetary disk to a solar system-like structure. So, the perfect disk subject was found. It was time to track some neon, a peculiar gas grate for disk exploring. It's one of the gases that are more likely to exist in protoplanetary disks. Plus, neon spits out electrons at pretty modest temperatures, which makes it easier to spot. After examining the region with the help of the JWST, scientists concluded that neon was indeed coming from further away from the star. But that was not all. Along with neon, the team found argon. It has been seen in several protoplanetary disks before, but its traces have never been this strong. Some senior researchers thought it wouldn't be possible to see them so clearly. But thanks to James Webb, and after vigorous tests, the results were confirmed. These results are a small but crucial step in understanding more about the mind-boggling nature of gas planets. A 40-year-long study has led astronomers to conclude that there's something seriously weird about Jupiter. The largest planet in the solar system doesn't seem to have seasons. The measurements have been taken both by spacecraft and ground-based telescopes. They showed bizarre weather patterns on the gas giant. For example, cold and hot periods throughout the year, which equal 12 Earth years. And at the same time, Jupiter doesn't go through seasonal changes like our planet. 
on Earth, weather changes between winter, spring, summer, and fall because of the tilt of our planet's axis toward the plane in which it orbits the Sun. This tilt, which is 23 degrees, allows different parts of the globe to receive different amounts of sunlight throughout the year. But Jupiter's axis is tilted toward its orbital plane by a mere 3 degrees. It means that the amount of sunlight that reaches different parts of the planet's surface throughout its long, long year hardly changes. But the new study has found that there are still certain temperature swings that take place all over the gas giant's cloud-covered globe. Astronomers claim they've solved one part of this puzzle. They've found some hints that such unseasonal seasons might have something to do with teleconnection. This phenomenon describes periodic atmospheric changes in seemingly unconnected parts of the globe, which can lie thousands of miles apart. Scientists have observed teleconnection in the atmosphere of our planet, too. One of the most famous examples is known as the Southern Oscillation. That's when changes in the trade winds of the western Pacific Ocean correspond with changes in rainfall across large territories of North America. As for Jupiter, when temperatures rise in specific regions of the planet's northern hemisphere, the same latitudes in the southern hemisphere cool off. Further research also revealed that when temperatures rise in the upper layer of Jupiter's atmosphere, called the stratosphere, it gets colder in the troposphere. This is the lowest atmospheric layer where weather events, such as Jupiter's powerful storms, occur. Researchers hope that by measuring all these temperature changes, they will eventually be able to make a more or less precise weather forecast for Jupiter. Maybe in the future, they will even be able to extend this to other gas giants to see if they have similar patterns. But this isn't the only mystery the gas giant can boast. Let's have a look at some other, no less intriguing puzzles. For example, a 2018 study that found that Jupiter had a delayed growth spurt. You might have heard that the most popular theory about the beginning of the solar system says that, at first, the Sun was orbited by a dust-filled gas cloud. Some time passed, and tiny pieces gathered together into lumps, which later formed planets. But Jupiter was the odd kid. It started off well. The gas giant was gathering around small clumps of matter for a million years or so. But once it grew to be as massive as 20 Earths, its development suddenly stopped. It could have happened after bizarre zones appeared in space. They emitted so much heat and energy that gas molecules struggled to merge with young Jupiter. This period continued for 2 million years. During this time, Jupiter only grew to 50 times the mass of Earth. But once this stage finished, the planet continued to gobble down gas like before. And soon, it swelled to its current mass, about 300 Earths. Jupiter's most famous feature is the Great Red Spot, a giant storm raging in the atmosphere of the planet and capable of engulfing two Earths. But few people know about the Great Cold Spot. It was spotted only recently when astronomers were checking data received by an observatory in Chile. It's believed that Jupiter's auroras spawned this unusual patch, which is around 400 degrees Fahrenheit colder than the surrounding areas. These auroras are ancient, it makes the spot thousands of years old. And unlike the Great Red Spot, it's not stable. It keeps shape-shifting, and sometimes it almost disappears. But it always returns to the upper atmosphere. Usually, it happens after a powerful auroral display. Now, storms are no stranger to Jupiter's atmosphere. But where there are storms, there is lightning, right? Yeah, but the bolts of lightning on Jupiter turned out to be very strange. They release radio waves, which is not strange. But for decades, every spacecraft visiting the gas giant managed to record something bizarre. You see, Jupiter's lightning only signaled in the low-frequency range. And no theory could explain why, since lightning on Earth emits radio waves from low to very high frequencies. Finally, in 2018, the Juno space probe solved this mystery. Apparently, the problem was not with the gas giant, but with our technologies. Unlike previous spaceships, Juno had extremely sensitive equipment, and it came very close to Jupiter. So it did record both megahertz and even gigahertz strikes. 
But even Juno confirmed that lightning on Jupiter was totally different from lightning on Earth. On our planet, lightning avoids the poles. It prefers to zap the equator. Meanwhile, the gas giant's equatorial zone sees no lightning. It lights up the planet's poles. And its peak frequency is 4 bolts per second. In 2017, when astronomers were searching for the theoretical Planet X, they noticed that some object outside the solar system was tugging at objects within. Thinking it could be what they had been looking for, they turned a powerful telescope in that direction. Coincidentally, that patch of sky contained Jupiter. And even though the researchers didn't find Planet X, they noticed 10 previously unknown moons orbiting the gas giant. This brought the number of the planet's satellite to a total of 79. But the coolest thing was that one of the newly discovered moons was very unusual. The thing is, Jupiter's moons move in packs. So two of the new satellites were spinning with a group that rotated in the same direction as the gas giant. And the rest was in a cluster spinning against the planet's rotation. As for our weird guy, it was inside the second group but spinning with Jupiter. Unfortunately, it means that the moon will most likely have a short lifespan. An anti-retrograde moon within a retrograde cluster won't be able to avoid a collision. Look at Jupiter's beautiful patterns. Look at these swirls and stripes. For a long time, no one knew the depths of these bands. But in 2018, scientists used a novel way to crack this riddle. This method involved the space probe Juno which orbited the gas giant every 53 days. Each time it passed by, it measured how strong the pull of the planet's gravity was. It helped astronomers create a 3D image of the stripes. It goes like this. The greater the pull, the greater the mass of the region below. And after examining the gravitational map, researchers concluded that the stripes ran shockingly deep. Most of them plunged to a depth of 1,800 miles. But Jupiter is a gas world, and the winds raging in its atmosphere shift all that mass around, making calculations very difficult. Jupiter has the strongest magnetic field of all the planets in the solar system. It's 20,000 times more powerful than that of Earth. But the gas giant's magnetosphere is a bit wacky. It's unique and doesn't resemble the field of any other planet we know about. Before, experts thought that Jupiter's magnetic field was similar to Earth's. Two poles connected with magnetic lines near the geographical north and south. But Juno showed that things on Jupiter are a bit messed up. The magnetic south pole is pretty well behaved, but the north pole is a different story. Intensely magnetic ribbons and chaotic pieces of field, some of them without even positive or negative counterparts. Plus, there seems to be another south pole. It might be that Jupiter's hydrogen ocean generates the magnetic field of the planet. And if scientists manage to solve the mystery of Jupiter's magnetosphere, they might also find out what's happening inside the gas giant. But first, they need to understand the bizarre behavior of the planet's poles. Picture a tiger. Tigers are known for their beautiful stripes which they always keep the same. However, imagine if the tiger's stripes could change their size, position, and colors from time to time. Magical, right? But that's exactly what happens with one titan of our solar system, Jupiter. Why and how? Well, astronomers might just have the answer, so let's see. Jupiter is a huge and fascinating planet. When you're looking at its picture from far away, it's like seeing a beautiful sunrise. Here, we have an entire palette from creamy pale yellows to caramel browns, with even some blue shades. Jupiter is a fascinating place made mostly of hydrogen and helium, just like our sun. However, it didn't gather enough stuff during its formation to become a star. Instead, it became a colossal ball of gas that could fit more than 1,300 Earths inside. Jupiter has these interesting patterns of dark and light clouds that go around the planet in alternating bands like giant stripes. These dark stripes are called belts, and lighter ones are called zones. Actually, it's not unique in this. 
Earth and Jupiter both have these cool patterns in their atmospheres. It's just that Earth has a few of them, but Jupiter has a lot more. Why are these belts brown and beige? Those can be explained by the combination of hydrogen, helium, and other trace elements in the planet's atmosphere. It's like mixing different colors of paint to create new shades. These belts create beautiful patterns across the planet's surface. Now, because Jupiter has such a massive atmosphere and a weather system similar to Earth's, it experiences some extraordinary storms. So even though these stripes may look calm and peaceful, they're actually part of a wild weather system. It's like a never-ending storm party happening there. These belts and zones move in opposite directions around the planet. The belts go against Jupiter's rotation, like going against the flow, while the zones go with it, joining the dance. And not only do they move in different directions, but they also exist at different heights in the planet's atmosphere. The belts are like regions where things are rising up, like bubbles in a fizzy drink. So the cloud tops in the belts are higher up in the sky compared to the cloud tops in the zones, which are more like sinking areas. So, even though Earth and Jupiter have the similarity, their weather is completely different. It's like comparing apples and oranges. One of the most famous storms on Jupiter is the Great Red Spot. But why is it red? Well, that's a bit of a mystery. Scientists think that the storm sits at a higher altitude than the rest of the atmosphere. This means it gets a stronger dose of sunlight. Imagine standing on a hilltop where the sun shines brighter on you compared to the surroundings. In a similar way, the Great Red Spot gets more radiation from the sun. The storm also contains some special chemicals in its clouds, like ammonia and acetylene. When these chemicals receive that extra radiation, they react in a unique way, giving the storm its distinct red color. It's like a special effect in a cosmic theater. Anyway, the stripes look pretty cool and all. But what's the big mystery around them? Well, you see, one day scientists decided to look at data from deep inside Jupiter, about 30 miles below the surface. And after peeking in Jupiter's secrets, they noticed something strange. When they looked at Jupiter using a special type of light called infrared, the colors of its stripes actually switched around. The light bands that were pale and creamy in normal pictures become dark in the infrared view. The dark bands that were belts before now shined brightly in the infrared. This suggests something interesting. The belts on Jupiter have thinner cloud coverings compared to the zones. It's like the belts are wearing sheer see-through outfits while the zones have thicker clouds like fluffy jackets. So, what we see as dark bands in normal pictures turn out to be bright in the infrared, hinting that these belts have less cloud stuff blocking the light. But here's the most strange part. Every few years, something changes. It's like the weather on Jupiter goes through a wild roller coaster ride. The colors of the belts can change, and sometimes the whole weather pattern becomes a bit crazy for a while. Scientists have been scratching their heads, trying to figure out why this happens. So they've decided to use a special spacecraft called Juno to investigate this. Since 2016, Juno has been gathering a lot of information about Jupiter like a spy collecting clues. One of the things Juno has been looking at is Jupiter's magnetic field. Just like Earth, Jupiter has a magnetic field. It's like an invisible bubble that surrounds the planet, extending to space. This magnetic field is really important because it protects the planet and everything on it. It acts like a shield against harmful particles from space, like those coming from the sun. But Jupiter's way bigger than us so his protective shield is much stronger. Magnetic fields are generated by something called a dynamo, which is like a big swirling conducting fluid inside the planet. This fluid moves around and rotates, kind of like a dance party happening deep within the planet. So scientists have been looking at the data collected by Juno over the years and noticed something interesting. Jupiter's magnetic field has its own little motions, kind of like when you see waves in the ocean. Scientists call these motions torsional oscillations, which is just a fancy way of saying wave-like movements. It's like Jupiter is doing its own magnetic dance. Now let's imagine that Jupiter's insides are like a giant pot of boiling soup. Deep within Jupiter, there are slow currents that carry heat upwards, just like a conveyor belt. This heat eventually reaches the upper part where we see the clouds. But here's where things get interesting. 
Imagine someone starts stirring the soup really fast with a spoon. Those wavy magnetic movements, the torsional oscillations, act just like that spoon. They create a disturbance that messes up the slow currents. Now this disruption has a big impact on Jupiter's weather. It's like turning up the heat in the kitchen and changing the way the soup cooks. The patterns of rising and sinking in the clouds, which we call upwelling and downwelling, get all mixed up. A whirlwind in the soup. Our clever scientists also noticed something special near Jupiter's equator. They discovered a concentrated spot of magnetism called the Great Blue Spot. And guess what? This spot is slowing down, like it's taking a break from its usual fast movement. This suggests that a new type of wavy motion, a new dance, is about to begin. So to sum it all up, the scientists have come up with a cool idea. These wavy magnetic movements, the torsional oscillations, disrupt the slow currents inside Jupiter, messing up the cloud patterns and causing wild weather. And when the scientists calculated the time it takes for these wave-like motions to happen, they discovered that they match the same time periods when the stripes on Jupiter change. So, in simple terms, the scientists think that these wave-like movements in Jupiter's magnetic field are causing the changes in the stripes on the planet. Pieces of a puzzle are coming together. Scientists are still trying to fully understand why this happens. But it's an exciting step forward in unraveling the mysteries of our vast universe. But there are still some mysteries left to solve. To find more answers, scientists need to keep watching Jupiter closely in the future. By observing how the clouds change, they can check if their theory is correct or if it needs some adjustments. From its massive storms to its colorful belts, Jupiter never fails to amaze us with its cosmic wonders. It may not have ignited as a star, but it shines brightly as a gas giant, captivating us with its size and beauty. So keep your curiosity alive and always reach for the stars. Extremely hot and insanely fast. <laughs> yeah, that's me. Oh wait, you mean the space thing. Okay, first, they discovered Peg 51, an exoplanet that orbits a star similar to ours. An exoplanet is any planet outside of our solar system that orbits a star that's not the Sun. This planet was completely different from anything we've ever found. Almost the same diameter as Jupiter, but half the gas giant's mass. It took only four days for this exoplanet to orbit its star, which seemed impossible. It was definitely too fast for something so massive. And then, scientists started finding something they've named hot Jupiters all over space. Lots of heated gas giants were located only a couple of million miles away from their stars. Sometimes, there were a couple of space bodies orbiting their stars pretty closely, and many were a few times bigger than Earth. Solar systems where they found hot Jupiters are not like ours. We have a neat system with smaller rocky planets on the inside and big gas giants on the outside. And almost all of them peacefully orbit the Sun, following their trajectories. Everything is in order. When a star is at the earliest stage of its formation, it creates a disk of gases, debris, and dust surrounding it. It's called an accretion disk. These gases slowly get pulled into the star because of its gravitational forces. And this leads to some kind of a stellar whirlpool. The outer parts of the disk are more gas-dense than the center. With time, the whirlpool effect gets even stronger. The same thing happens with hot Jupiters, which causes these gas giants to start orbiting much faster than usual. This also carries it further toward the star in a tightening spiral. Luckily, our Jupiter didn't become a hot Jupiter. Our gas giant started its life as an icy Earth-sized asteroid, which is different from the way hot Jupiters form. During the time when it was forming, Jupiter was around four times as far from the Sun as it is today, somewhere between Uranus and Neptune. About two to three million years after Jupiter first formed in the accretion disk of our Sun, it started a 700 million year long phase astronomers call the Grand Tack. Now, Tack is something a boat performs when going towards a buoy and then slipping past and around it. Then it speeds up and goes in the direction where it came from. That was the same thing Jupiter started doing, and in its tightening orbital migrations, the planet's gravity could have moved many asteroids and other space bodies, distorted the orbits of larger planets, and caused collisions and chaos. 
Jupiter's grand tack would have destroyed many big space bodies. It's a could-have-been scenario, but luckily, Jupiter changed its course and became a peaceful gas giant. Neptune, Uranus, and Saturn were starting their own version of this chaotic process. Saturn even got so big that its gravity started pulling Jupiter away from its orbit. But after some time, these gas giants' orbits became locked. Then both of them managed to clear away the gases remaining between them. And since these gases were some sort of fuel for the planet's migrations, Jupiter and Saturn could both finally settle into the stable orbits we know today. Jupiter can still lob one to two icy asteroids at the inner planets from time to time. But when our planet was younger, this could have been one of the processes that formed the oceans on Earth. But Jupiter is much calmer these days. Saturn's gravitational forces have moderated the situation and are now keeping it under control. Now, Jupiter is our protector. It's two and a half times the mass of the other planets of our solar system combined. It's some sort of a gravitational shield orbiting around the inner part of the solar system. Jupiter redirects incoming debris and asteroids away from the inner planets – Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars – keeping us all safe. Because of this, Earth has always been protected, so our planet has had enough time to evolve complex life forms. And it hasn't been destroyed by asteroids, hot Jupiters, or other space bodies. Jupiter wasn't the only planet that could have collided with Earth. Scientists think Mercury might have been involved in a hit-and-run accident with our planet. Mercury is the innermost planet in our solar system. It's the closest to the Sun and the smallest planet out there. And it also keeps getting smaller. Nowadays, its diameter is around 9 miles smaller compared to its size 4 billion years ago. Scientists think this might be happening because the planet's core is made of iron, and this iron is cooling and becoming solid, which is slowly reducing the planet's size. Mercury is the planet with the biggest number of craters in our solar system. Its atmosphere is really thin, so it can do nothing to keep the planet protected from meteors. The largest crater on Mercury's surface is at least 963 miles across. It could fit Western Europe, from Germany to Portugal. The object that formed such a crater must have been at least 62 miles long. With all these craters, Mercury looks similar to our Moon. It orbits the Sun faster than the other planets, so one year on Mercury lasts around 88 Earth days. That means celebrating a birthday every three months or even more often. At the same time, the planet rotates so slowly that a day on Mercury lasts almost 59 Earth days – a long time to wait to go to bed. There's a piece of Mercury on our planet. In 2012, a green meteorite was found at a street market in Morocco. Scientists studied its composition and concluded it could be from Mercury. Mercury doesn't have its own moons because of its small size and weak gravity. Plus, the planet is too close to the Sun. By the way, the only other planet without moons in our solar system is Venus. Mercury has a really thin crust, like a good pizza. <laughs> One of the theories of the planet's formation claims there was a major collision where the planet lost most of its crust. It could have also moved Mercury from its original spot. It wouldn't be unusual. The gas giants in our solar system also didn't form in the location where they are today. Mercury also has an eccentric orbit, which means it could have been kicked out of its old orbit and moved to a new one. Scientists also think Mercury might have collided with the early Earth. One theory says that's how the moon could be formed. Out of all the material flying away after the big crash, there might even have been pieces of Mercury's crust in the mix. Exoplanets Kepler-107b and Kepler-107c are a pair of planets that orbit a star similar to our Sun in the Kepler-107 system. It's around 1,700 light-years away from us. These planets have almost identical sizes, both with a radius one and a half times that of Earth. But one of them, Kepler-107c, is almost three times as dense as the other. That's because the planets have a different composition. Some scientists believe that Kepler-107b is less dense because it probably collided with another unknown planet in the past. This powerful hit took away part of its surface and left behind a very dense core rich in iron. A huge comet hit Neptune around 200 years ago. But since Neptune isn't a rocky planet with a thin atmosphere, like Mars or Mercury, it's harder to find evidence of this impact. 
But a comet called Shoemaker-Levy 9 broke apart in 1994 and smashed into Jupiter. Astronomers managed to record this event. It helped them learn more about the elements and molecules the collisions left in Jupiter's atmosphere. This information helped scientists realize that the amount of carbon monoxide in the upper layers of Neptune's atmosphere is higher than in the lower ones. This means a big comet likely hit the planet in the past, since comets have carbon monoxide in their icy tails. Something huge slammed into Uranus, too, changing the planet forever. A space object twice bigger than Earth hit the ice giant. This left the planet tilted, and it looks as if it's rotating on its side. Uranus is extremely cold, way colder than it's supposed to be. It might mean that the object that slammed into it was probably a young protoplanet made up of ice and rocks. Also, some of the debris from that collision may have created a thin shell around Uranus. It still traps the heat coming from the core of the planet. There are strange energy pulses bombarding our entire galaxy. And they come from the other side of the universe. Over the last decade, scientists have been observing bizarre flashes of light coming toward our planet. This phenomenon is called fast radio bursts, or FRBs. These signals travel through a couple of billion light years of dust and gas. That's a rather long way. So far, no one has figured out what's going on behind these bursts. Uh Uh-oh, hurricane alert! Everyone's hiding! The speed of the wind outside is more than 75 miles per hour. Seems like a lot. But this storm is moving at 400 miles per hour. Wait, do such speeds exist? Yep, but to see a storm that fast, you'll have to travel to Jupiter. So let the journey begin. The planet is huge. Almost 1,300 Earths could fit into this gas giant. It's also incredibly hot, with the temperatures reaching about 43,000 degrees Fahrenheit at the planet's core. Unfortunately, you can't land on Jupiter's surface because, well, being a gas giant, it doesn't have any solid surface. But you can go deeper into Jupiter's atmosphere. Look at these thick brown, yellow, red, and white clouds passing by. They're what make the planet look colorful and kind of striped. If you continue descending toward the center of the planet, you'll see its atmosphere, mostly made up of hydrogen and helium gas, becoming liquid. It happens because of immense atmospheric pressure. The planet's core itself is a mysterious object. Scientists still haven't figured out whether it's a molten ball of thick liquid or a solid rock 14 to 18 times the mass of Earth. Anyway, exploring Jupiter isn't the main goal of your trip. No, you've arrived here to see the Great Red Spot. It's an enormous storm raging in the southern hemisphere of the gas giant. Its top parts are towering more than 5 miles above the tops of the surrounding clouds. The storm is 1.3 times wider than our planet. In 2017, NASA's Juno space probe managed to collect lots of data about the red spot. And it turned out that this monster of a storm goes more than 200 miles down into the planet's atmosphere. That's 30 to 100 times deeper than any ocean on Earth. But these measurements are most likely imprecise, and the storm's true roots can be reaching even deeper. The Great Red Spot is colder than the rest of the atmosphere. And keep in mind that Jupiter's temperatures are minus 234 degrees Fahrenheit in the upper cloud layers. On the other hand, the closer to the core, the hotter it gets. Mysteriously, the highest temperatures ever recorded on the gas giant occurred in the atmosphere right above the Great Red Spot. There, the heat reached 2,400 degrees. This temperature is higher than that of lava on our planet. Astronomers believe that the turbulence caused by the storm might produce gravitational and sound waves that can be responsible for the superheating. But the storm itself is warmer at the bottom than at the top. People have been watching the moving vortex on Jupiter for more than 150 years. Some time ago, astronomers predicted that it would gradually slow down and become smaller or disappear entirely. But that turned out not to be the case. After having analyzed all the data received with the help of the Hubble Space Telescope, researchers were baffled to discover that the winds at the outer boundaries of the storm had actually picked up speed. The change in the wind speed is no more than 1.5 miles per hour during one Earth year. It's a tiny change, but however small the difference is, it still means a lot. 
the wind speed at the edges of the storm can reach a mind-boggling 400 miles per hour. That's faster than Earth's tornadoes. At the same time, if you found yourself at the center of the Great Red Spot, you wouldn't be too impressed. The winds there move way more slowly. Scientists faced lots of challenges when they were trying to understand the mystery that was the Great Red Spot. It's unclear what fuels the storm. Can it be the nature of the storm's home planet? Since it's a gas giant, Jupiter doesn't have any solid ground, so there's no friction, which might be the only thing that could make the storm weaken. The hot gases in the planet's atmosphere are always moving, rising, falling, swirling. Just like on our home planet, where cooler and warmer air mix and merge into one another, forming giant circling storms. Astronomers think that once, several enormous storms could have come together and created the Great Red Spot. And now, it keeps going by constantly drawing cool gases from below and hot gases from above. Plus, the storm might be absorbing other smaller vortices. This makes the Great Red Spot even more powerful. Unfortunately, thick clouds on Jupiter don't allow astronomers to see what's going on in the planet's lower atmosphere. Scientists have been speculating on what may hide beneath the Great Red Spot for decades. Is it a massive volcano? Eh, Unlikely. Jupiter is mostly made up of gases, and it doesn't have a crust that could crack, letting lava escape from the planet's interior. There are also a few theories explaining why the storm has its trademark color. It varies from whitish and pale salmon to bright orange and brick red. Some scientists believe the answer lies deep below the Great Red Spot, closer to the planet's surface. A colorless layer of gas might be reacting to the UV radiation coming from the sun. This is probably what gives the storm its red color. But so far, it's just a theory. Hey, your guess is as good as mine, huh? Jupiter isn't the only planet that can boast having a giant storm. Another one, as wide as our home planet, rages on Saturn. It's called the Great White Spot. How clever! The storm has a tail of white clouds encircling the entire planet. It occurs every 30 years or so. The storm indeed starts as a spot, but then it starts stretching and stretching. Astronomers have figured out that the Great White Spot is actually a huge system of thunderstorms. At the top of the storm, lightning can flash more than 10 times per second. But the main mystery about the Great White Spot is where it gets its energy from. Some scientists think it may be powered by the sun. Others argue that the storm's cloud pattern only makes sense if there's an internal source of heat that can power the winds. Anyway, severe storms on different planets of the solar system aren't the only space mystery that makes astronomers scratch their heads. Let's move to Pluto, the largest known dwarf planet in the solar system, and explore its atmosphere. It rises really high above the surface of the planet and has more than 20 layers, all of them freezing cold and extremely condensed. By the way, our moon also has some sort of an atmosphere. Called an exosphere, it consists of helium, neon, and argon. It's 10 trillion times less dense than Earth's atmosphere. While traveling through space, watch out for black holes! Woo! A black hole is a place where gravity is so strong that even light can't get out. But black holes can sometimes behave like a massive galactic volcano. From time to time, they flare up. Sounds like me. But instead of spewing lava, they produce enormous amounts of energy. And this phenomenon leaves gaping holes in the surrounding material and gas. A short while ago, scientists discovered one of the largest craters in the universe. Radio and X-ray telescopes detected a supermassive black hole that threw a temper tantrum many, many years ago. It happened in a galaxy cluster about 390 million light-years away from Earth. The crater this event left behind could fit 15 Milky Way galaxies. Yeah, I can't get my head around that either. During your space voyage, think twice before landing on unknown planets. Otherwise, you may end up in a place like K2-141b. That's a planet outside of our solar system. At first glance, it's not that different from Earth. It has liquid oceans that evaporate, form clouds, condense, and get back to the surface as rain. But instead of water, it rains rocks. The surface of this exoplanet is covered with lava seas dozens of miles deep. The temperatures on the K2-141b reach 5,000 degrees during the day. 
That's toasty enough for the magma in the oceans to vaporize into the atmosphere. Then, supersonic winds, which can move at the speed of 1 mile per second, carry this rock vapor into the planet's night side. The vaporized magma cools down, becomes liquid again, and falls as a rocky ring. Uh-uh, not a vacation spot. Too hot. I'll pass. Imagine leaving your house one morning and seeing not one, but two stars shining in the sky. The first one is our good old sun, and the other is Jupiter. But how has a planet turned into a star? And what will now happen to Earth and its inhabitants? Before we find the answer to these urgent questions, we need to revise some things we know about Jupiter. The largest planet in the solar system is a gas giant, which means it's made up mostly of gases. Due to the pressure and temperature differences, these gases separate into layers. This creates those red and white bands that can be clearly seen from Earth. The temperatures at the top of Jupiter's atmosphere are insane. They can reach a whopping 1,340 degrees Fahrenheit. The planet also has an immense gravitational pull. In 1995, the Galileo probe reached the atmosphere of Jupiter and sliced it at a speed of 106,000 miles per hour. It survived the scorching temperatures and started its descent. It kept moving even when the temperatures suddenly dropped and the pressure, as well as the speed of the wind, increased. But 58 minutes and 97 miles into its exploration, things went downhill. The pressure of 23 atmospheres and still high temperatures finished the probe off. It was melted and then vaporized by the extreme heat. Now, if Jupiter suddenly decided to keep growing, it would eventually become a star. And its composition would allow this planet to do it. Once, a long, long time ago, Jupiter took most of the mass that was left after the formation of our Sun. That's how it ended up with more than twice the combined material of all other bodies in the solar system. And the planet's ingredients are the same as those of a star, mostly hydrogen and helium. Jupiter is just not massive enough to ignite. But what if it was? Then it would turn into another kind of celestial body, most likely a brown dwarf. In this case, it would have a minor effect on the orbits of the planets of our solar system, because brown dwarfs are more massive than planets, but not as massive as stars. A brown dwarf is usually 13 to 80 times the mass of Jupiter. It can only become a star if the pressure in its core gets high enough to start nuclear fusion. So let's imagine that it's happened, and Jupiter has become a real star. For example, a red dwarf. Red dwarfs are stars with masses around 7.5% to 50% of the mass of our Sun. Red dwarfs are also hotter than brown dwarfs. Their temperature can reach 6,380 degrees Fahrenheit. Our Sun, by comparison, has a temperature of almost 10,000 degrees Fahrenheit. So, it means that the newly formed red dwarf will be far dimmer than the Sun. And still, Red dwarf Jupiter could prevent the inner planets from following their orbits, because they wouldn't be able to find a balance between the gravitational forces of the two stars. The planets would move either closer to the Sun or closer to the newly formed red dwarf. If Earth chose the first option, our main star's insane temperatures would probably wipe all living beings off the face of the Earth in no time. If it was the second scenario, we'd probably freeze since Jupiter, as a dim red dwarf, wouldn't be able to warm us up well enough. But there could be one more option. The inner planets could get thrown out of the solar system altogether. If Jupiter was a star, it would also greatly increase the amount of radiation the surface of Earth would receive. Our atmosphere would have to protect us both from the radiation coming from the Sun and from Jupiter's radiation. Red dwarfs are notoriously active, that's why Jupiter, just like the Sun, would most likely have frequent coronal mass ejections. This is a fancy expression for describing large clouds of electrically charged particles a star releases with a huge burst of speed. Even now, Jupiter has a significant impact on our planet. The gas giant is roughly 318 times as massive as Earth. And this also means it has an outsized pull on our planet. 
Its gravity can cause shifts in the orbit of our planet and climate swings every 400,000 years or so. When Jupiter's influence is the strongest, Earth usually has colder winters, hotter summers, and more intense periods of wetness and droughts. Also, if Jupiter turned into a red dwarf, its most prominent feature might probably disappear for good. I'm talking about the Great Red Spot. It's an enormous storm raging in the southern hemisphere of the gas giant. Its top parts tower more than five miles above the tops of the surrounding clouds. The storm is almost twice as wide as our planet. In 2017, NASA's Juno space probe managed to collect lots of data about the red spot. And it turned out that this monster of a storm went more than 200 miles down into the planet's atmosphere. That's 30 to 100 times deeper than any ocean on Earth. But these measurements are most likely imprecise, and the storm's true roots can be reaching even deeper. The Great Red Spot is colder than the rest of the atmosphere. And keep in mind that Jupiter's temperatures are negative 280 degrees Fahrenheit in the upper cloud layers. On the other hand, the closer to the core, the hotter it gets. Mysteriously, the highest temperatures ever recorded on the gas giant occurred in the atmosphere right above the Great Red Spot. They were higher than the temperature of lava on our planet. Astronomers believe that the turbulence caused by the storm might produce gravitational and sound waves that can be responsible for the superheating. But the storm itself is warmer at the bottom than at the top. People have been watching the moving vortex on Jupiter for more than 150 years. Some time ago, astronomers predicted that it would gradually slow down and become smaller or disappear altogether. But that turned out not to be the case. After having analyzed all the data received with the help of the Hubble Space Telescope, researchers were baffled to discover that the winds at the outer boundaries of the storm had actually picked up speed. The wind speed at the edges of the storm can reach a mind-boggling 400 miles per hour. That's faster than Earth's tornadoes. At the same time, if you found yourself at the center of the Great Red Spot, you wouldn't be too impressed. The winds there move way more slowly. And now, I have another what-if situation for you. What if Jupiter collided with the smallest star we know about? Today, these two space bodies are on a collision course. A spoiler, Earth might not survive such an encounter. Okay, meet this tiny red dwarf. It's the size of Saturn, and its gravity is around 300 times the gravity of our planet. It normally floats 600 light years away from Earth in a double star system. But today, for some inexplicable reason, it's broken all the laws of the universe and is rushing toward the biggest gas giant in our solar system. And even though this space guest is smaller than Jupiter, its mass is way greater, and its gravitational force soon starts to pull on the gas giant. The heat from the red dwarf, plus its powerful gravity, makes Jupiter grow in size. The planet's atmosphere starts to puff up because the gases that make up the planet begin to heat up and expand. Jupiter's atmosphere starts to leak into space toward the stellar visitor. Sometime later, the runaway gases form a bright hot ring around the red dwarf. This is a terrifying view, as if a black hole, a very bright one, has appeared inside the solar system. The star keeps tearing Jupiter apart, eating chunks of the gas giant. And soon, the red dwarf engulfs it completely. Sadly, Jupiter never stood a chance. Instead of the gas giant, we now have a red dwarf surrounded by a ring of hot gases. And we already know how badly it may end. The best thing about it is that this scenario is totally imaginary. Phew, thank goodness. There are almost no similarities between Earth and Jupiter. Ours is a sweet, small planet with plants and cute pandas. Jupiter is a giant gas horror with furious hurricanes which never subside. And if you fall into this planet, you might literally fly through it. But what would happen if our Earth was the size of the father of the solar system? Oh, this is gonna be fun. Jupiter is a planet so big 
that I bet you can't even imagine its scale. Its radius is about 11 times the radius of Earth, and it's about 316 times more massive. So, to turn Earth into another Jupiter, we'd need to increase its radius by 11 times. If the planet's density remained the same, then the mass of our new Earth would increase greatly. Actually, it'd be as much as four times larger than Jupiter's. Of course, these changes wouldn't go smoothly. The very first thing that we would immediately notice, nope, not the size, gravity. It would increase by about 11 times compared to old Earth's. Scientists say we can actually survive on a planet with greater gravity, but only if it's less than five times stronger than what we have now. Well, let's assume that we're daredevils, always ready to challenge nature. What would our life be like? Well, not very pleasant. After each step, you'd have to sit down on a bench and take a break, as if you've just run a marathon. Yes, it would be that hard to walk. Oh, and good luck with getting up later. In order to somehow move around this planet, we'd have to pump up very strong muscles. No more problems with junk food, because you'd have to become a heavy lifter just to get to the refrigerator. The force of gravity affects not only movement, but also the size of everything. Do you know that many astronauts gain some height due to weightlessness in space? So if you're worried about being short, here's a solution for you. On the other hand, strong gravity would make us all shorter. This would go not only for humans, but for everything on our planet. Trees would become very small. To grow upward, they would have to move water from their roots to branches which would be unrealistic with such gravity. So they'd all turn into little bushes. Also, no more mountains. Even the largest ones would become very small. But at least now, everyone would be able to conquer Everest. This would also apply to animals. Our pets would have to quickly evolve into pumped up corgis just to be able to walk somehow. Oh, and say goodbye to birds, of course. If you think that's not enough suffering, let's add another thing. It would be very difficult for us to breathe. Atmospheric pressure would increase dramatically. That's because Earth would start to pull air toward itself with great force. You'd literally feel the weight of it on your shoulders. Remember what I said about taking a break after each step? Now, imagine that you'd also have to breathe through a pillow. Yeah. And that's not all. Atmospheric pressure plays an important role in the behavior of water molecules. It would be much more difficult for water to boil or turn into ice. Most icebergs would melt, and it's possible that we'd have no more clouds, too. All water vapor would come crashing down on us in giant torrents of rain. We'd be lucky if we didn't get flooded instantly. But, oddly enough, there would also be some advantages. For example, Everything around us would become much more spacious. Assuming we didn't get flooded, there would even be a bunch of deserted areas on the planet. Maybe land prices would finally fall. But these unexplored areas would most likely remain unexplored, since we'd hardly be able to travel across seas and oceans. Not only because moving across the water would be incredibly difficult, but also because all water bodies on the planet would become 10 times larger. The very thought of getting lost in the ocean is frightening, but imagine if it was 10 times deeper and bigger? Uh-oh. So, no more sailing. And forget about flying by plane, or visiting space ever again. But it seems like it's still not all. If Earth was the size of Jupiter, we'd also have volcanoes raging everywhere. Due to the increase in its mass, Earth would become terribly unstable. All extinct volcanoes would become active again, and there would be lava and poisonous gases everywhere. In 1883, there was the most destructive eruption in the history of humankind, the eruption of the Krakatoa volcano. It occurred on one small island, but people all over the planet could feel the consequences. The eruption destroyed the island, triggered many tsunamis, and clouds of poisonous gases spread for miles. Now imagine this, 
but 10 times worse. That's what would happen on our Jupiter-sized Earth. It would probably be similar to the fall of the Chicxulub meteorite, the one that wiped dinosaurs off the face of the Earth. Then, poisonous gases spread all over the planet, causing one of the greatest massive extinctions in the history of Earth. Oh, and we would also lose the magnetic field, like the cherry on top of the cake. The magnetic field is very important for life on Earth. According to Rory Barnes from the University of Washington, it shields life on the planet from the nastiness of space, which means all sorts of radiation and solar winds. There's a molten iron core inside our planet that is responsible for producing the magnetic field. If the amount of pressure on this core increased due to gravity, it could solidify. And because of this, Earth's magnetic field would disappear. We would be exposed to the effects of cosmic radiation. Too scary to even imagine. All right, so now we know that living on this new Earth would be a real nightmare. But what about outer space? You've probably heard that Jupiter, thanks to its strong gravity, protects us from asteroids. Well, this would become our job. Jupiter experiences about 24,000 collisions a year. And now, it'd be our destiny. Do you remember me mentioning the Chicxulub meteorite? Similar tragedies happen to our planet once every 100 million years or so. But if it became the size of Jupiter, these guys would visit us every Friday. Also, we'd have to say bye-bye to the moon. Our natural satellite is too close to us. So if Earth grew in size, it would be a real catastrophe. We would literally watch the moon being torn apart in the sky. Of course, after that, all these fragments would crash into us. One of the theories claims that billions of years ago, the moon somehow separated from Earth and its pieces gathered into a ball. Now, it would be like watching its creation rewind. And even if the moon survived, somehow remaining in Earth's orbit, the changes in the tides would still be dramatic. The consequences of these changes would be very unpredictable, but probably a bunch of tsunamis would be some of them. On the other hand, we'd probably gain a couple of new moons. Jupiter has as many as 79 of them. It would probably be a spectacular view if only gas clouds from all those volcanic eruptions didn't block it. Also, the appearance of a second giant planet would have significant consequences for the whole solar system. Don't worry, other planets wouldn't crash into us. Many people underestimate just how far the planets are from one another. But still, the new Earth would shift the orbits of other planets a little and affect the rotation speed and Earth itself would rotate around the Sun much more slowly because of its huge mass. For example, one year equals 12 Earth years on Jupiter. All this, of course, would greatly affect seasons and the climate in general. So, would there be life on Earth? Bold of you to even ask this question. But if one day we do manage to find a habitable super-Earth close to Jupiter in size, it would be very interesting to take a look at it. Sand is everywhere, in your eyes and mouth, in your hair, under your t-shirt, and in your shoes. You can hardly stand. The wind is so strong, it's Ow! knocking you down. Suddenly, an especially powerful gust sends you to the ground. You crawl toward the back door. It takes you a lot of effort just to pry it open. Once inside, you get to your feet and sneak a peek outside. Just clouds of dust and a deafening roar. Okay, it's time to call for help. It started a month ago. One day, you went out to the garden behind your house. It was a windy day. You even spotted a tiny tornado under your apple tree. It hardly reached your knee, lazily swirling around tree leaves and dust. You tried to make it disappear by poking it with your foot. But even after several attempts, the mini whirlwind just didn't want to break apart. You shrugged and went back home. The next day, the tornado was still there, and had it grown? Interestingly, instead of growing taller, it got wider. At that moment, it started munching on your flowering shrubs. You got curious and decided to keep track of this unusual phenomenon. You measured it every day, 
and carefully wrote down all the information in a special notebook. Maybe later I'll write an article or even publish a book about my storm, you thought. One day, you got out of the house to find your favorite apple tree broken. You couldn't figure out how it happened. The storm still looked harmless and too weak to damage a rather large tree. But after this accident, you started asking yourself if not calling for help was the wrong thing to do. Apparently, it was, because just a month later, your mini storm has suddenly grown to twice its original size. It's unsafe to go outside now. It seems as if your house is in the middle of a real tornado. You can't see the sky behind a wall of dust and debris. Your garden is ruined, trees broken, bushes and shrubs pulled out of the ground and sent flying somewhere far away. You hear your doorbell ring. A group of scientists you invited has come to the rescue. You show them the garden with your personal natural disaster and enjoy their stunned silence. But after a couple of seconds of initial shock, they spring into action. Ignoring the howling wind, they start carrying inside different equipment. It looks very complicated. Your kitchen turns into the researcher's laboratory. You get informed that your house will be temporarily used by the scientists. You take your things to the smallest bedroom and watch the professionals work. Your kitchen is filled with beeping gadgets and devices covered in flickering lights. People in protective suits and lab coats scurry around. Surprisingly, they don't bump into each other. Neither do they create traffic jams. You bring the notes you've been taking and hand them to an elderly man in a white lab coat. He thanks you as if you've just given him the gift of his dreams. The next several days pass in a flurry of activity. The storm in your garden is growing. The scientists seem to get gloomier every time you see them. It's around 2 a.m. when something wakes you up. You blink your eyes open and realize the house is shaking. Your homegrown tornado must have gotten so big it's reached the house. In the morning, several scientists pull you aside to tell you the unpleasant news. You have to move out. The storm is indeed growing. Soon, it'll wipe your house off the face of the earth. Nothing can be done. You're gaping at the people telling you to get out of your house. Where will you go? They tell you they're building an additional research lab not far from the place. It's important to be able to observe the storm in real time. Anyway, there's a spare room with everything you may need in that facility. Why don't you stay there for a while? It would also be convenient for the scientists. They may need you to answer the questions that appear during the process. You agree because you don't have any other choice. The researchers help you transport your stuff to your new accommodation. You walk around your house, saying goodbye to your favorite coffee table, your sofa, and your cozy bed. The scientists tell you that there's no time to move your furniture to another place. The next day, you wake up to the news that your home is gone. The storm gulped it down at around 4 a.m. Over the next few weeks, the grown-up whirlwind has swallowed two houses of your neighbors, the nearby forest, several abandoned cars, and a small flower store. It's now so big, it's coming close to a large lake several miles away from the town. People get evacuated. The authorities have announced a state of emergency. One day, you notice that scientists are talking in hushed voices. They look even more worried than usual. You corner one of them and try to find out the truth. Soon the scientist spills it. The researchers have got some evidence that confirms their worst fears. According to all their estimates, the storm that once started as a tiny tornado in your garden is going to grow into another great red spot. Only on Earth. Crimson-colored clouds are spinning counterclockwise at an incredible speed. Beneath them, you can see vibrant hues of the largest planet in the solar system, the gas giant Jupiter. Those clouds are called the Great Red Spot. It's a colossal storm raging in the atmosphere of Jupiter. If you found yourself at the storm center, the winds would be rather calm there. But on the edges, the storm's speed can reach 425 miles per hour. That's twice the speed of the fastest and most severe hurricanes on Earth. Over the decades, the size of the red spot has been changing. Right now, it's 1.3 times as wide as our planet. The storm's roots go as deep as 200 miles into the planet's atmosphere. The average tropical cyclone on Earth usually stretches for no more than 9 miles from the bottom of the storm to its top. 
the unique phenomenon on Jupiter, has existed for so long because the planet doesn't have a solid surface. It consists of layers of clouds made up of vapor, water ice, and ammonia. Underneath, there might be an ocean of liquid hydrogen. Our planet is solid, and hurricanes slow down and break apart once they go low enough to touch the surface. But the Great Red Spot has nowhere to make landfall. That's why it keeps raging. The scientist also tells you the most bizarre and alarming thing about the storm in your garden. Instead of growing weak and disappearing many weeks ago, it's not only still going, but it's also getting bigger and more powerful. Even the most experienced specialists can't explain this phenomenon. After analyzing it for days on end, they've come to the conclusion that it shouldn't have appeared on Earth. It's against the laws of nature. Interestingly, the storm's composition is a bit similar to that of the Great Red Spot. You're impressed, but still can't get why the researchers look so worried. It turns out that your once mini storm is likely to grow as large as that on Jupiter. But since Earth is way smaller than the colossal red spot, it's likely to swallow our planet whole. It'll grow and grow, wiping out towns and cities, forests and highways. At the same time, it'll become more powerful. People will have to leave their homes and get evacuated to relatively safe areas until there are no more safe areas left. This process will take years, but it'll still be too fast for people to prepare. There will be two ways to deal with this global problem. One of them is to colonize the moon or another planet, for example, Mars. But it's an incredibly long process, and the storm will conquer the entire planet before the first spacecraft with people leaves Earth. Or scientists may try to stop the hurricane. There's a technology called the sunglasses effect. Billions of tons of dense gas get pumped into the atmosphere. This gas absorbs sunlight and cools down ocean water, which is the engine of any hurricane. The researchers aren't sure if this method will work with your storm. It formed not over the ocean, but in your garden. 